uh, here in the UK, and Manfred Rudiger, who's CEO of uh, Chiatis Pharma. Uh, these are two very special leaders in the advanced uh, therapy space, and I've had the privilege of working very closely with them as my company is involved with both of these companies uh, in their development and manufacturing, development and or manufacturing needs. My company is called PCT and we're a contract manufacturing and development company in this space that focuses exclusively on advanced therapies and cell therapy. And we've, and, and we've got, a, I think, a unique business model. Now we're looking at today's challenges and, for, and solving those, <coughs> excuse me, either through development, direct development into the clinic, uh, performing clinical trial manufacturing work, phase one, phase two, and phase three work. Um, and then we're also uh, moving into uh, into the commercial sphere and preparations to do that. And while we're also preparing through innovation and engineering technologies, uh, much as what you heard before from Cindy, and, uh, such as GE and others, in trying to prepare for the future when the when the model changes and when the paradigm changes, once again to try to form the, the solutions around the challenges that are uh, uh, that are in uh, front of us. So I'd like to ask now at this point um, to ask James and Monfred to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about their, uh, themselves, their companies, uh, uh, and their therapies, and then we can uh, jump right into some of the challenges and how they are, uh, how they're facing them at the moment. James? Thanks very much, Bob. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, uh, we were asked to keep our answers short, so I will uh, suffice it to say that we are a T-cell receptor engineering company for autologous T-cell therapy and cancer. We have three open IMDs in the USA. Uh, we have uh, breakthrough status and prime uh, status in Europe for our lead program. Now we're doing an antigen called NA, so following great results in uh, the South Carolina. I'll stop there. Thank you. Perfect. James, that gives me more time to talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be a fireside chat, isn't it? <laughs> I thought this would be water. <laughs> Is it <Yeah>. water? <laughs> <laughs> That'll be my secret. So, yeah, so Kiyadis Pharma is also working in the immuno-oncology space, obviously. Uh, we are uh, one of those companies which do old school stuff. So we are not having genetically engineered cells. We manipulate um, donors, uh, or their donations for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in a way that family members can be used without causing graft versus host disease. We do believe, and we are very strong on that, that stem cell transplantation remains put refractory patients into remission and one of the <coughs> topics in immunology is to what extent the responses are durable to what extent they would be curative and I think we will try to, to explore a bit on these things uh, we have been working with uh, Bob uh, for a long time uh, because we also realized at a certain point in time that cost of goods is an issue and that we, uh, of course, have to set up manufacturing professionally. We're based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Very good. Thank you, Manfred. <clears throat> so, um, as I mentioned before, the, the two of you are, are um, I think, both great leaders in the companies. You both understand the space. You've both been doing this for some time. Uh, Manfred, we go back a long way, actually, yeah. uh, <laughs> too, probably too long. But, but, we, um, but, you know, I think your perspective on where we are on this journey would be interesting. So, James, maybe you could start us off by telling us a little bit about how you view the industry as a whole, this path, this journey. Where are we right now uh, on the journey? And it, it's interesting because what Manfred is doing is improving bone marrow transplant technologies, which could be said, if you don't consider blood as a cell therapy, certainly bone marrow transplantation is one and probably the first uh, so of the cell therapies. The established immunotherapy out there. Yeah, the first established <laughs> immunotherapy, exactly. Um, and, that, and James, you're really on, the, on a far different end of that spectrum, uh, more to the engineered T cells. So can you talk a little bit about where we are in the journey of the industry as a whole, in your view? So, uh, I, I think uh, I've been in the industry for uh, over 25 years, probably, almost as long as you, Bob. So oh. it's been a, it has been a long journey, and I'm old enough to remember when monoclonal antibodies first hit the sort of commercial side. And I can remember, you know, we had tragedies, we had deaths, we had uh, terrible manufacturing problems. There was a company called Synergen in Colorado, I remember, it spent hundreds of millions on building its own factory because it couldn't find anybody to, to build them. We then had the human antibody against mouse, uh, human antibody against the mouse element, and we had to humanize them. It actually took quite a long time to get from the initial stages to uh, what is now seen, well, it's obvious monoclonal antibodies were a wonderful thing, but... Uh, the 
great responses, and I'm sure we'll hear from Manfred about his uh, data. The, the fact is that what you could do once you get good data, you get the regulators on side, you suddenly get an undercurrent of industry suppliers of every sort. I mean, I think we're the biggest uh, buyer of wave machines from GE in Europe, and we obviously use BTT. But I would say that every three days I get an email from somebody saying we can perform some thing which is going to improve your methodology. So I see it very parallel situation that you start with efficacy, start with academic type processes, start with efficacy, and everything else will fall into place. But we are in the foothills of that right now. <clears throat> so yeah. Manfred, we've talked about the foothills before, right? That, that we, we, yeah. we continue to say, well, I remember years ago, we said that we're the, bio, bi, we're the uh, biotech industry of 10 years ago. And now we're saying 20 years ago, 30 years ago. <laughs> so well, yeah, what, what's, what's holding us up right now? What do you see as the, as, uh, as the on this journey, where, where are we, and why, why are we not making that leap as quickly as we, at least maybe some of us thought we might? Oh, we're making it very quickly. We are just uh, creating expectations we have, which are maybe very difficult to match. So I don't think the industry is moving too slowly, and advances made are very significant. It's just sometimes um, that financing seems to require that people generate expectations which are sometimes a bit too strong, mm -hmm. but that should not irritate us uh, to realize what has been achieved. And I think the big, big change vis-a-vis -vis three, four years ago is that in cell therapy, there is tectonic changes in efficacy. So there was efficacy for the first products that were developed, uh, Provenge, uh, many others. But what we see now is really uh, landscape changes in efficacy. As, as uh, James said, there is high response rates in refractory patients. Uh, there is durable responses <coughs> for refractory cancers. And I think these leaps in efficacy have made big pharma, uh, at least some of them, move off the fence and, and join um, these developments and back them with their financial muzzle and other advantages they would bring to the table. So I think we are very far down the road to see um, uh, products being approved that would not only work in a clinical trial, but which also could generate a commercial success, which has not been the case so far. None of the products which have been approved was really a blockbuster. And uh, all of us being uh, the second mice getting the cheese, we had the chances to learn from, uh, from all the experience that earlier uh, stage products, uh, manufacturing-wise, efficacy-wise, uh, could bring to the table. Uh, so we are not yet there, but we, I think we are very close. I, so, I agree on the, on the speed thing. I think, uh, I think what's happened is that two of the CAR T-cell companies, or the the three, three companies in CAR T-cells, because they were able to go from pilot studies straight into pivotal studies, Everybody thinks that actually it just takes a year in man. Yeah, yeah. 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 Carl was uh, playing around with those CD19 car T cells. I remember mean, 10 years ago. I mean, you know, it's taken an awful long time. It's just that the corporate end of switching from pilot to pivotal studies made it look very, very uh, simple. And I think what they've done is the, they've had to take academic manufacturing processes and just run with them and then try and change them during the phase three. And I think what's going on now is the regulators are more and more saying, actually, we need to standardize some of this stuff. So it's bound to take longer, but I still don't think it changes the, uh, the basic uh, tenet of the, uh, of the efficacy and the durability of it. Well, I think we tend to, we tend to judge the, the length of time by our own lifespans. And since we're involved in this, it does feel like a long time. But it's true when you step back and you look at it, it doesn't take any longer. This is sort of typical, um, uh, you know, typical movement in a, in a um, you know, in any kind of industry as you build and learn on the past. So, well, you talked about uh, e efficacy, both of you, in, in, the, in the last panel. Um, I believe the word transformative came up, and you know, in that concept of transformative therapies, that does seem to turn the tide for us a little bit. And um, can you talk a little bit about what you guys think is transformative? What does it mean to be transformed? Do we have to provide for cures? Um, and if not, is it 10% of patients doing something? I mean, how do you define transformative in, in a way that will help us drive this uh, field forward, continue to drive it forward? I think from our, from our point of view, it's a very good chance, which I define as at least sort of three in 10 patients have a much better response than they would have on anything else. I think. 
the, you mentioned uh, Provenge. I think the problem with Provenge is it had a slight effect in one of its phase three trials on a very slow growing cancer. I think the cell therapy transformative doesn't mean a slight effect um, in a very slow growing cancer. It means changing something from a 4% response rate to a 50% response rate. It means actually letting people go home because there's enough uh, you know, improvement, as we heard with the haemophilia example earlier on. It means actually changing the lives of patients. If you don't change the lives of the patients in a reasonable percentage of those patients for a reasonable length of time, I don't think it's transformative, and that's what we're all working towards. Yeah. So transformative, in, in my view, uh, is big changes for as many patients as possible at affordable prices. Mm -hmm. if, if you can bring, like the CARS do at the moment, um, highly refractory patients into remission, uh, but then three months later they are no longer in remission, then it doesn't justify a price of a million. You know? So it, it just all uh, goes together that the reimbursement, um, the duration of the response and the number of people that benefit from it um, have to make sense. If you bring patients into remission and then you can immediately transplant them and they have that benefit, then that is transformative. If in hematological uh, cancers you will finally have a donor for everybody and not just for two-thirds of the population, then it's transformative because these approaches are established to be of curative potential. It's not like Tarsiva in pancreatic cancer a couple of years ago where the mean survival was increased by two weeks uh, for additional three months of vomiting and nausea. So that is not transformative in my view. But what we see in cell therapy or many disease indications today, if it can be rendered commercially viable, manufacturable and scalable, that is transformative. Sure. And we will still be alive when that becomes a reality, yeah. I'm quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> so so, um, <clears throat> so uh, Provenge was, you're saying, not transformative by that definition, so the cost was too high? If the cost were lower, then the level of transformability would have been okay. And he's a 300 and something million dollar business, not a bad business, actually. Not a, especially for the first sort of big product, if you will. Market penetration was not great, but it was there. I mean, a lot of, a lot of good takeaways from that story. Absolutely. I, and every success uh, uh, has to be, uh, um, you know, has to be welcomed. And, it, you know, and uh, actually the whole concept of getting things through to regulatory approval, even with, uh, you know, GSK's <coughs> ADA skid product, it's a very, few, very small number of patients, but actually it shows you can get something through uh, all the way to market through the regulator. So these things are absolutely essential. Um, and I think the most important thing for the industry is to learn from, uh, learn from things in the past, what does and doesn't, uh, doesn't work. I think Provenge, it, you know, it was very successful, but it was less than a tenth of the success people had anticipated. Um, and I think also it, it uh, had very big manufacturing side, and it sounds a really boring detail, but they could neither freeze the apheresis of the blood cells coming from the patient, nor could they freeze the product. And actually, it's things like that the industry had to sort out, because that really is a difficult model, because cells don't stay stable unless you can freeze them. So it's a very, very difficult uh, thing, and that's actually something. <coughs> things like that, these so, so in, they sound very incremental changes, but those are the fundamental things of getting things to sort of doability and marketability, in my opinion. You know, a small thing like that drove the entire business yeah. model, actually. It was yeah. fascinating. But it's, but it's also yeah. sometimes quite binary. Yeah. I, I, I still believe if the first three patients that Carl Juhn had treated, and which were reported in the New England Journal paper as having been on intensive care with multi-organ failure for quite some time, if not all of these three kids would have survived in 2011, I don't think the whole CAR-T field would be now where it is. So sometimes you also just have to be able to materialize uh, the strong <coughs> potency of the drug and get the side effects on the control. Well, this goes to that question about cure is cure transformative, and certainly in the case of the CD19 CAR Ts, there were there were what we see as cures, and here we go again, right? We're saying <laughs> these are all going to be cures, so it is a dangerous it's a dangerous bar to set. But maybe you can both address. And I think your perspectives on this are really interesting. Uh, you can address where do we go from CAR T, CD19 CAR Ts? Where do we go from uh, products that do have a target such as CD19 to those that have a less clear target? And how do we make now that leap and that evolution into the next uh, series? 
So, so for us, we, we've never been in CAR T-cells, actually, although we were um, in Carl Jean's lab with our own T-cell receptor, so we were following his CAR T-cells very closely. Um, the, the essential difficulty of CAR T-cells is the lack of targets that are available for the CAR T-cells program. I, and I, um, although there are CD19 and people talk about three or four others, I mean, to give you the reason that we're in T-cell receptors is actually because of the large number of targets. And from those, you can select targets that are not on normal tissue. And I think that... Is what you do need to have is a large number of targets to create an industry, and that, that's what we're, we have. For, I think we have 60 targets in house, just to give you an idea, each of which is multi cancer. So compare that to any CAR T cell company, it is a very difficult thing. And I think being able to have lots of targets isn't just a numbers game, it means you can pick, select targets that are not on, um, not on healthy tissue. And I think the other uh, key area where I think the T-cell receptors, we have shown data and the CAR T-cells haven't, is in, in the field of solid tumours, because we've been talking about the CAR T-cells are wonderful efficacy. Actually, it is wonderful, but it's in hematologic tumours. And there's a whole series of questions to do with access to the tumour, which obviously don't ha are not an issue with a hematological tumour, but are an issue with solid tumours. So I think there are lots of directions we have to go. I think it's to have different targets, and I think it's to be able to convert what is essentially a blood-borne cancer um, therapy with CAR T-cells to a, more, a broader selection of uh, cancers. I'm not in CAR T-cells, I'm not in T-cell receptors, but we are in generally, of course, having discussions on what's next in immune oncology. And um, I don't know. We don't have a fire. I have no crystal ball. Uh, but what is clearly a challenge is, is the lack of obvious targets. So over the last 20 years, roughly, um, all these monoclonal antibody people haven't been stupid and they haven't been lazy, but they couldn't come up with very many other targets. There is CD19, uh, there is EGF receptors, <coughs> HER receptors, uh, VEGF receptors, <coughs> and that's about it. I mean, there's a few CD somethings, but mm -hmm. the number is very limited. And the optimization in monoclonal antibodies was on engineering the glycosylation patterns to better activate the immune system, to collaborate with the uh, monoclonals and that have been the major improvements and these mm -hmm. are the bio betters and other versions which are launched now. So it, it, it is not easy, for sure it will not be easy to find <coughs> more <coughs> additional targets for CAR T's. Um, okay. if it, we, we, we were running these uh, thought experiments. If you, if you would run a CAR T against the VEGF receptor, all your endothelia would peel off and not only uh, in next to tumors. If you would uh, run a CAR T against EGF, uh, EGF receptor, um, you, you would not just get a skin rash like you do with the monoclonals, you would just peel the skin off. And so you have to have a super strong specificity and cancer-specific expression of these targets, and there aren't that many. But it doesn't mean they will not be found, and what we are confident about is that the immune system of the human body has mm -hmm. the imminent ability to be specific enough and to work efficiently against all kinds of cancers. But when and what and how many, I don't know. Well, we've talked about, um, about the cost of goods uh, a number of times and, and manufacturability, if you will, and how manufacturing in this industry, perhaps especially in this industry, uh, drives so much of the business model. Uh, what are you all thinking about manufacturing, manufacturability right now, particularly with respect to the fact that the clinical development programs are moving very quickly and there are these accelerated pathways that mm. are almost leaving us, you know, from the side of the guy who's been doing the development and manufacturing, the clinical people never catch up with us. And now I find myself in a position of chasing after and trying to move a lot quicker because we will we'll be launching these products in one form and moving them into another form later to really get them to robust quality, cost of goods, scalable and sustainable features all the way through so that they can sustain themselves through commercial. What are you thinking just to close now about manufacturability and where we are with that today? Well, for us, there are two halves of the manufacturer. One is the vector and one is the cell manufacturing. And uh, you do our cell manufacturing for us, so the best way to cut our cost of goods is you cut your prices. So, uh, <laughs> Was Don't that, count on it. <laughs> was, that the, was that the answer you wanted? No, I think, I think that it's... That was not what I was looking yeah. for. It's, be, I mean, it's becoming immensely... For a fee, we can cut off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
touche. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I, I think that side has just been. I mean, even yeah. since we were been working together, which is a few years now, um, you know, we've come a long way in improving the processes. But it's all very technical and detailed, so it doesn't sound very interesting. Um, and actually, I think right now, I think the vector is more an issue than the uh, than the cell manufacturing is actually uh, quite limited. We use a lentiviral vector, and it's actually quite difficult to get uh, the vector made um, efficiently and uh, and cheaply. Um, so I think this will have to be addressed. But I have to say that so many players have come into the market, actually in Europe as well now, um, as well as uh, in the United States over the last three years, that it'll have the same effect as everything else. It will, will become much more efficient um, over the next three, four, five years. Right. Manfred, any thoughts? Yeah, you know that we are putting the dossier together as we speak to submit to EMA in the first quarter of next year. We underwent the uh, certification procedures uh, that EMA offers and from which we uh, benefited a lot. But it's clear that the manufacturing process that we're using in our pivotal trial is already different again from what the process was uh, that underwent uh, certification with EMA. So the most important, in my view, is to be closely aligned with the regulators to make sure that you have appropriate measures to have control change uh, during the manufacturer and make sure that you are outsourcing manufacturer, you have somebody to blame if it goes wrong. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, it's a That's challenge. <laughs> Gentlemen, but it is an ever-changing uh, thing, manufacturing. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, Bob. Okay. Thanks. 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 Thanks.